ladies and gentlemen good morning good afternoon and good evening uh, we have people joining in from all across the globe a very warm welcome uh, to you all to the ninth edition of espresso live an online thought leadership forum featuring procurement leaders and practitioners uh, my name is uh, shakti prasad and i'm your host today i am the head of content at bero and i run the procurement espresso magazine uh, next slide please yeah uh, before i get started with the session uh, just a few housekeeping rules uh, to be kept in mind all the participants will be on listen only mode for the entire duration of the webinar uh, we will take up the questions at the end of the presentation but we would encourage uh, our attendees to key in their questions any time during the session please type them into the question box uh, given in your control panel uh, you can either post a question or a comment uh, we will read it out for you uh, you can post them any time during the event you know you don't have to wait uh, for us to formally open up the q and a segment now, there could be a lag of a few seconds uh, in between the transition of slides uh, so please bear with us if you have any difficulty in joining the webinar uh, please try to uh, log back in or key in your queries uh, in the q and a box and we will try to help you now i am happy to introduce our guest uh, tom nash uh, the cpo of uh, american red cross uh, tom joins us from the american red cross uh, field office uh, in cincinnati ohio uh, i hope you all can uh, see him on your screens uh, Tom is a procurement veteran with over uh, 30 years of experience in four different uh, industries. Uh, in fact, he has uh, institutionalized the stakeholder management. Uh, I mean, like we mentioned in the invite, he has institutionalized the stakeholder management uh, soon after he uh, joined the Red Cross in 2015. Uh, for those uh, who may think that perhaps uh, such a move is possible uh, only in a nonprofit organization, I would like to point out that Tom had already instituted this idea uh, at previous companies. Uh, he had worked in uh, four different industries, all of them Fortune 500. In fact, one of them is a huge oil and gas company. And Tom, of course, would uh, talk about it uh, in, during the course of this event. Uh, so it's, this is not something which uh, is done uh, you know, only one particular sector. If done right, Tom believes uh, this can work out in, across industries. Uh, as the old English idiom goes, uh, what's good for the goose is good for the gander, right? Uh, anyway, so let's get started. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Yes, uh, Tom, welcome. Thank you so much for uh, joining the event today. Uh, Tom, so why stakeholder, stakeholder management is so important and so important for procurement? And why is it generally considered the heartbeat of the function, you know, from your experience? If you could share us some nice anecdotes, it would be great. Yeah, no, happy to. And first of all, thanks, uh, Sakti, for you and our good friends here to uh, for inviting me today. And uh, the other thing I'll just say up front is, look, what I'm going to share today is kind of what I've uh, learned about over my many years in, in this uh, a function. And also as being a customer of the function, I've actually ran a small business, so I've been in operation. So what I'm going to share with you is when we talk about stakeholder management, it's uh, this this works in any area, right? So whether you're a CEO running a business or a business leader or a, a chief procurement officer, a chief financial officer, a chief information officer, chief marketing officer, chief legal, it, 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 it all works, at least in my experience. And, and I think this whole concept of stakeholder management goes back to what I've learned. It's all about relationships. So at the end of the day, no business, no function, no company can be successful without relationships. And that is the heartbeat of how business and commerce gets done. And so procurement is no different, um, but I think sometimes we in procurement forget that, that, hey, we're, we're no different. And so we have to manage this in a way that um, is practical and it's meaningful. And, and what I mean by that is, look, at the end of the day, procurement is a team sport. We don't get things done without working through others, which includes our suppliers, obviously, those are our external stakeholders. 
and our communities we operate in, but also our internal stakeholders. You know, these are all our business units, our corporate functions that we work with, and our executives. These, the, all that drives from relationships. And I would submit to you, and we'll talk more about this today, that if you don't start with that foundation of having good relationships, this probably won't be as successful as you'd like it to be, this thing called being successful in procurement. So I just start with that because I think that is uh, kind of the foundation of what we're going to talk about today. Look, it's uh, stakeholder management. It's about relationships, and it's not just the heartbeat of procurement. I would submit it's the heartbeat of any organization that's engaged in commerce. Well, that's very, that's very well put, uh, Tom. Uh, you know, you've been in the industry for thirty years. So, quick question before we move on to the next slide. Uh, you know, cost savings versus stakeholder management. Which one do you think? Uh, takes precedence? Well, I think uh, I, I would submit to you that you're not going to get cost savings or PL improvement unless you have stakeholder engagement. <laughs> uh, because again, you know, procurement can't do this alone, nor should they do this alone, right? I mean, this is one of the things, Sakti, you and I talked about offline. Look, yeah. uh, you know, procurement has to be accountable for what they do. They are not accountable for running the business. They are not accountable. They shouldn't be accountable for PL targets. But yet a lot of procurement organizations have an, their own procurement cost savings targets. I don't think that's a very good approach because when you do that, then the stakeholder is like, what are they accountable for or the business? And, and I would submit to you, look, it's the business's money. They have to be accountable for that. And, and I have a very simple philosophy. It goes like this and I, it served me well in the number of places I've been. The role of procurement is to propose and facilitate the role of the business, decide and own. Those are two different things. And when we get clarity around that with our business leaders, it, it the place works a lot better. Because in my experience, the business typically doesn't want to be accountable for their spend. They want to delegate that. And yet they have to be right there making sure that this Im what impacts their business, they're engaged in. Just like I have to be engaged to help them. Yeah, indeed. Uh, in fact, you did mention that procurement should not play the cop. They should not be the sheriff, uh, <laughs> you know? Ex exactly. It should not be like the police department, you know? That really caught that, my uh, that's attention. Right. And <laughs> that, that's right. Look, I mean, and, and unfortunately, and it's not just procurement. Look, you could go to HR, legal, marketing, any corporate function. Uh, the, the ones that are less sophisticated, they want to be the policeman or the policewoman. They want to read somebody the HR policy. They want to read them the legal policy. They want to read them the marketing policy. And unfortunately, I hope nobody on this call does this, but uh, we have some that want to read the procurement policy. Mm. I don't want to do that. I want to basically say to the business, the business, look, we all have to operate within boundaries. I don't need you to read you the policy. You know the policy. My job, my team's job is to help you execute within the boundaries. And we'll be creative about this because, again, this is about business performance. We have to help the business uh, perform. And uh, when they come to us with problems, we shouldn't just say, oh, we can't do that because it doesn't fall on our procurement policy. We should say, no, no, we will help you navigate the procurement policy to be successful. Exactly. And hence, next slide, please. <clears throat> yeah, so you you beautifully mentioned that, you know, procurement shouldn't be reading the, uh, you know, policy, the riot act, uh, so to speak. <clears throat> and... Uh, you had institutionalized the stakeholder process, which is, again, uh, something which uh, I haven't come across anywhere else. If anyone has done it, maybe they could drop a note. Uh, so how did you manage to you know, establish this, uh, uh, Tom? Uh, there, of course, there are, there are four points in there on the slide. Maybe you could talk about that as well as how, how, it, how it all came about. Sure. No, I'll be happy to. So it's kind of an interesting story. But before I just tell the story, I'll, I'll just say the word institutionalized, that's a pretty strong word. I would may, I would say this, this is a journey and this okay. takes practice, right? I don't think anybody's perfect in this and, and I'm not suggesting we are, but we're getting better, right? And it does take practice. And here's how this whole board thing came about. When I worked for a major oil and gas company, and I'll just say the name so people know, I worked for Shell for most of my career. And when I was at Shell, I was the global process owner for procurement. We had a global shared services company that went across all the Shell operators. And I used to work in the operating units, and I ran a small business in the operating. So I, I came from that world. And my boss at the time, who was the executive vice president, chief financial, he came to me and said, hey, Tom, 
we want to, I'm thinking about putting together a tender board. Uh, what do you think about that? I said, well, Mark, a tender board and our European colleagues, that's really just about bids, you know, a bid board, you know, re reviewing bids, procurement review bids. That's okay. That's pretty tactical. But I think, Mark, we want something a little bit more than that. He said, well, what do you, what do you mean, Tom? I said, well, I think we want something that has the business engaged looking at procurement strategies differently. He said, oh, okay, well, let's think about that. And then collectively, and I wish I, I could take all the credit I can't, we had a gentleman in our European office that took a stab at writing up the first concept of what we're talking about today. We called it the Global Procurement Board. And what it was, was it was a tender board on steroids, basically, because instead of just looking at tenders or bids, it looked at any initiative that required a third party supplier, whether it was a fact based negotiation, whether it was a benchmarking exercise, whether it was a, a, a should be cost model, anything that dealt with a supplier we made sure that the business leaders agreed and endorsed what that strategy was. And I will tell you that when we put this in place, and this was back in 1999, so this, this has gone on for 20 plus years, worked every place I've been, including here, the power of that is it gets the business engaged. Now think of the difference here. When I talk to some of my other CPO colleagues in the Global Fortune 5, they say, oh, Tom, we have a procurement council. We, we do something similar to this. This isn't a procurement council. Because a procurement council is typically procurement people talking to procurement people across businesses about that. That's good. There's nothing wrong with that. This takes it to another level where you have the senior business executives engaged reviewing what procurement does and endorsing strategies. And I would submit to you when you have that level of alignment, because here's the problem it's trying to solve. It's basically trying to say that what is the role of procurement? Well, it's not just propose and facilitate, it's to help the business improve its performance. Well, you can't help the business improve its performance if you're not clear on the business direction. And the best way to get clear on business direction is to have the business tell you every month during your board meeting what's their direction is. <laughs> so therefore the strategies we present are aligned with that direction. We work collaboratively with them, to again, make sure we're solving real business problems and improving business performance. Okay. Uh, so would you like to elaborate how, you know, this board, uh, you know, endorses, ensures, and sure. also exercises some of the yep. uh, plans that, you know, come, come their way? Yeah, exactly. So just just remember again, this is uh, this is not just procurement for procurement's sake. This is procurement to help the business improve its performance. So here's how the here's how the stakeholders exercise their role. So first of all, let's go back to you know the people that sit on the board. To get this right, what I did here at the Red Cross and I did in other places, I go directly to the presidents of the business and I ask them. First of all, do you agree that this would be a good idea? Typically, they say, well, yeah, Tom, we'll give it a try. I'm not sure. Uh, gosh, I've never seen this before. So they'll usually be willing to at least try it. And then I ask them, okay, okay, if you're willing to do that, then I either want you or your deputy, a direct report to the president, to be a member of the board. Because this board is a decision-making body. We are not just coming together and saying, well, we'll come back and decide later. The board decides. So I make it very clear to the president that when if they're going to exercise their leadership, they have to have the president's authority to make decisions. And so mm -hmm. if they if the pre, and and I will tell you with one of our presidents today, he sits on the board himself. A couple of other presidents, they've delegated their direct reports, but then those direct reports know they're carrying the the president's decision making authority. And so how they exercise their role is when they come to the board, their job is to listen to the submittals that come forward. And, and think about how the submittals come forward. The submittals come forward through their business. So their lower level people in the business are working with my category managers, our directors, our senior directors to make sure these submittals strategies are sound. Then when they get to the board, the role of the board members, and I'm a board member, as well as our other senior executives, is to ask good business questions. Does this fit with our strategy? Is this well thought through? Did we think about um, how this will impact changes in our business? Um, did we think about where's our supplier diversity? Where's our sustainability? Where's our ESG connectivity? Where's our innovation with our suppliers? How is this going to contribute to our fiscal 25 plan? Uh, these are the things that the business executives, these are business questions that they challenge us on. 
right? Their job is to be a respectful challenger. And then if they agree to say, I'm in agreement, or if they don't agree, then they have to say why they don't agree. So that's how the senior stakeholders mm -hmm. make sure that we're working on the right things as a company, not just procurement, but as a company, and it drives this collaboration at a very senior executive level. Okay, uh, so I believe uh, you know proposals were uh, the contract value of over two fifty thousand uh, dollars. There's a threshold that you have kept. Only those proposals come to the board, and uh, you know contract value below two fifty thousand dollars don't come to the board. Is there any logic as to why uh, it's structured that way? Yeah, that's a great question, Sakti. Look, and we went through this when we first started this at Shell. Look, you have to pick a materiality limit that makes sense for your business. So as an example, for the Red Cross, we're the size of a Fortune 600 company. We're about a three plus billion dollar year revenue organization. And by the way, we, we have a pharmaceutical business. We have a blood business, right? We're an FDA regulated business. So we're not just this sleepy nonprofit doing good work for people in need. We do that, of course, but we also have businesses here that we actually sell uh, blood and we also sell Red Cross certified uh, products and services. So when you when you have that um, uh, size of a business, you have to think through what's going to be re relevant to the business senior business leaders. They are not going to want to look at a fifty thousand dollar contract or a fifty thousand dollar initiative. That's just not going to be the right use of time for senior executives. So you have to be strategic in picking, choosing the materiality limit. What we simply did. And it's worked every place I've been, including Shell. We looked at our total spend for the year. So at us, we have a billion three spend, which is about 45% of our revenue, second largest expense we have. We looked at that and we said, okay, of that spend, how much of that, how many of those initiatives are greater than 250,000? You'd be amazed how small that number is because most, most purchases in any company are less than $1,000. Even if you're mm -hmm. a global fortune 500, people don't realize that. There's a lot of really low value spend. So when we looked at it here, it came out to be about 70 or 80 initiatives a year that are greater than 250. We said, okay, that's manageable to bring forward each month to a stakeholder advisory board to review. Now, at Shell, it was a little different, right? Because we're a $300 billion a year outfit with a much larger spend. So we did the board weekly. That's a, That takes a level of discipline to do that, to do it weekly. So the, the, the size of the Material element will depend upon how much spend do you have and what size. Choose carefully, and then how often is your board going to meet? And something that you're going to be able to make sure that the business agrees to. Okay, uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, moving on, uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So, of course, we spoke about uh, you know how the uh, board operates, uh, you know, in detail, uh, you know, in the previous slide. Uh, so what are the protocols uh, and, you know, any advisories, uh, guidelines that you have given to the team so that they know what exactly to present, how to present, you know, yep. from a point of view of template, structuring, uh, legal yeah. language, etc. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's also a very important point for the board is, look, this has to be a structured approach. It's not going to work if it's just uh, not very structured, because, look, you're dealing with senior executives at the presidential level. They don't have a lot of time. So you got to make this really crisp and you have to make it meaningful. And so what we do is the board meets the third Wednesday of every month. It's on the calendar a year out. So nobody can say they didn't know when the board meeting was. It's the third Wednesday of every month. It's at the same time. And look, the way the time is, and, and I would choose this strategically as well. We did this when we were at Shell. We did it in all the other places I've been. Look, you got to pick a time that works for people. And, and then people say, well, Tom, you'll never get a time that works for everybody. Well, we have an antidote for that too. And I'll talk about that here in a minute. But here's what we did for, for here at the Red Cross. And we did a similar at Shell. We start a little bit before normal business hours. Well, why did we do that? Well, that way people don't have an excuse that they can, they're too busy. So we start our board at 7.45 a.m. Eastern time. Our normal work hours start at 8.30 and we keep it to an hour. And that way people know in advance that it's it's there, it's a regiment. And then to your point, Sancti, it operates like a board of directors. So yeah. what this is, is we have a board submittal template. It's a couple pages 
that my team, our category leaders, have the have the the bean to work with the business, their business colleagues to develop to fill out that template, which asks basic questions about why are you coming to the board? What's the purpose of this? What's the strategy? Where's the benchmarks? Where's the facts? What uh, evidence do you have that this is a good strategy? So all that diversity, sustainability, all that's in there. And they work with their business colleagues to, to put that together. And then when that comes to the board, this is also the aha moment for a lot of folks. It's not my team that presents it because again, it's not our money, it's the business's money. So the, so the business leaders present it to the board and think who's on the board, it's mostly their senior executives. So now it gets it into the reality, oh my God, I gotta be accountable for this spend. I'm the business people here or the function people. That puts them on the spot. And I will tell you, they when they when they do that, they take ownership, and then they want to pull in procurement because they say, "Oh my God, I got to go before the board procurement. I need your help. I don't want to fall flat in front of my senior executive. I want to make sure we got a sound strategy here." So there's a method to the madness of having them do the do the presentation. Now we coach them in advance. We're right there, and what we always say to the business colleagues who are presenting to the board, guys, look, you you got to feel com comfortable with this, right? So we work with them in advance. We we also tell them, hey, we're right there. So the category leader is right there at the board with them. So therefore, if there's any commercial questions or questions that the business colleague can, if they can just turn to the category man and say, hey, Sally, I need a little help here. Can you remind the board of what we did here? So it's a team effort, right? And I will tell you that in my experience, that builds the collaboration because mm -hmm. now it's natural. It's not just procurement banging on the door saying, I need to be here, I need to help you, blah, blah, blah. No, no, the business is now pulling us in versus us pushing. They're pulling in because, oh my God, we gotta go before the board. I need some help about how I'm gonna develop my strategy to do this. That's the power of what this is. And then lastly, look, th we also have defined board guidelines. They're about on eight pages. They're very uh, specific about how the board operates, who sits on the board, what's the protocols. And I'll just give you a simple example. Again, who sits on the board, that is a direct report to the president or a direct report to the functional leader or themselves. So as an example, our CIO, he sits on the board himself. Our CFO, my boss, he sits, he's the chairman of the board. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Yeah. Our yeah. Uh, chief marketing officer, she's delegated that to one of her uh, senior vice presidents. That's okay, but we have literally, there's about 12 senior executives, including myself, that sit on that board that we get together every every uh, third Wednesday of every month. Here's the last thing I'll say, because this question came comes up. Well, Tom, what happens if the board member doesn't show up? Well, I will tell you, we have an antidote for that. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and I think it's a pretty sh uh, good way to operate. And the antidote is simply this. It says it in the board guidelines. Board member, if you don't show up, you have two choices. Your first choice is you can send a delegate, but be careful. That delegate will carry your president's decision-making authority because this is a decision-making meeting. Or if you don't wanna do that, then your other choice is don't show up, but then you'll have five business days after those meeting minutes go out, and the meeting minutes are very detailed. They go out within 48 hours of the board meeting. After five days, if we don't hear from you, we consider that your business endorsement to move forward. We're not waiting on anybody. And that sends the right message because I will tell you in running this board for the last five plus years here at the Red Cross, I can count on one hand how many times those senior executives missed a board meeting. <laughs> so that tells you not only because we have the antidote, but because they see the business benefit of this uh, of this board. Now, I'll, I'll use a real life example. Our president for one of our businesses here, he said it this way. He says, Tom, I've worked in a lot of different industries like you. I've never seen a board operate like this. Yeah. I've never seen this visibility and transparency into what procurement does. And Tom, I am so thrilled that we have this level of discipline and level of collaboration. I've never seen anything like it. And that's that's a real powerful testament to the work that we're trying to do here. Uh, yeah, indeed. It is, it's a very, the story that you're telling is very unique, Tom. In fact, uh, next slide is, uh, next slide, please. So th this is my favorite, in fact. Uh, I mean, one doesn't, you know, often hear this happening. Uh, the CFO is uh, chairing the board. Of course, you did mention the composition of the board, uh, you know, in yep. the previous slide. So let's let's focus on the CFO bit. You know, why is yep. it important? I mean, yep. why did you invite uh, uh, the CFO uh, to chair the board? 
and and yeah. I believe you're reporting to the CFO, right? So yeah, exactly. So this is my boss. So 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 look, I will tell you that if you're going to set up a board like this, you have to have a senior executive chair it, and it should not be the chief procurement officer. I could chair it, but if I chair it, then it becomes a procurement thing. If a business executive chairs it, then it becomes a business thing, and so. It's, there's no magic here if it's the CFO, it could be the COO. In some cases, procurement reports into the chief operating officer. If you're a major manufacturer, procurement, the CPO reports to the chief operating officer or the CEO, like I've reported to CEOs in my past. It doesn't matter. It, it's got to be that individual that's a senior business leader, preferably someone that the CPO reports directly to, like a CFO, COO, or CEO. And the reason for that is, again, when the business sees this as a business imperative, not a procurement thing, then they want to be part of it. And and I'll, I'll give you a quick story. When I asked my boss, the CFO, to first chair the board, he says, well, Tom, I'd be happy to chair the board. What do I need to do? I said, Brian, you only need to do one quick thing. I said, you just got to show up. He said, that's all I got to do. I said, that's all you got to do. He says, oh, I can do that. And I said, well, Brian, and, and obviously, if you want to ask good questions, you can, but you won't even have to do that because all the business leaders will want to impress you to make sure they're showing that they're asking good business questions. So it'll work very nicely. And I will tell this group here on this call that in the five plus years we've been doing this here at the Red Cross and in the other industries I did at Shell, the amount of times that that board chair hasn't been at the board has been very limited. Why? Because they see the business benefits of this. And, and, a, and a quick story, if I may, our CEO here today at the Red Cross, uh, she said to me, this was about a couple of years ago, she said, yeah, Tom, it's interesting, that board you got, man, that thing really works. And she said, Tom, you know, your boss, my, the, who, who's my direct report, he, he comes to your board more than he comes to our own board of directors meetings. <laughs> and I said, well, well, he does that, Gail, because he sees the value of what we're doing and he's proud of it, right? Just like I told you that president who sits on the board, they're proud of what we're doing together. So now it just, it, and again, this is a key takeaway for the folks on the phone, I think, because I learned this long ago. This is not just procurement for procurement's sake. It's procurement to help the business improve its performance. And yeah. if we remember that, then when this becomes a business imperative with the business wanting to do things, good things happen. Exactly. In fact, uh, your philosophy is, you know, put business in front and then enable business, uh, you know, for, uh, on the, from the sidelines, so to speak. In fact, when exactly. we spoke the other day, uh, you had cited uh, your inspiration, you know, General Dwight Eisenhower, the yep. leader of the Allied forces in World War II. Right. And you had quoted him, uh, and I have the quote here in front of me, so let me read that. Yep. A quote, uh, the art of motivation is getting people to do what you want them to do because they want to do it. Exactly. Exactly. That is so powerful. And I thank you for remembering that, Sakti. Look, General Eisenhower mm -hmm. said that to the troops before D-Day. Mm -hmm. And the reason he said that is because he knew as any leader, you cannot force people to do something they don't want. Yeah. And and how are you going to how are you going to tell 300,000 men they got to go storm a fortress Europe uh, and, and that they they don't want to do it? Well, you're not going to force them to do that. So his point was, General Eisenhower, that's the art of motivation. This is why this is an influence model. It's not a command and control. We influence the stakeholder to do things that they want to do because they want to do it, not just because we told them it's a procurement policy. So that's the, <laughs> that's the beauty of the board, right? They come to the board because they want to do this, and they see the business benefits they get back in P&L improvement. And by the way, we don't call it cost savings. Cost savings mm. is procurement speak. We call mm. it P&L improvement because that's business speak. That's how the business looks. It's got to help their profit and loss statement. So they see the P&L improvement that comes from this. They see the innovation that comes with this when we work closely with suppliers, particularly diverse suppliers. They see the sustainability that comes out of these submittals. They see how this helps their business direction and particularly their targets. They all have targets. So when the board helps them meet their target, it, it's, it's a win for everybody, right? The business leaders are like, my God, I, I love this because uh, procurement's actually being a help here. They're not trying to hurt me, they're helping me. Exactly. Uh, so how did you manage to convince uh, your business stakeholders? I mean, uh, I mean it's, it's one thing to uh, you know do a quotable quote, yep. but it's entirely a different thing to actually 
uh, get this uh, running on the ground. So how did you manage to do that? Yeah, and then, and this is the practice, right? This this takes the practice, and it's a it's a little different skill set that uh, I was fortunate that I've had some really good leadership in my career that uh, you know helped me along here. And this is what you got to talk to people, and you got to mm-hmm. talk to people in their language, not not procurement language. So as I said to you earlier, I went to the three presidents in our businesses here today, and I asked them. I said, guys, here's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to make sure that my organization better support your organization. And I made it real for him. I said, guys, look, you're paying my bill. I don't, I'm not a business. Uh, you got to pay the freight, right? So all the money that uh, it costs me to run procurement, you're paying that. So you want your return on investment, don't you? Oh yeah, I want to make sure you're doing all what I want you to do. Well, here's your opportunity, right? Because every month you're going to see what we're working on. <laughs> and they're like, oh yeah, that's a good idea. So then, Tom, I don't have to come to you every month and ask you how many heads you got over there and why you're costing so much, right? No, exactly. You don't need to do that because we should be demonstrating every month the value that you're getting from my organization, procurement. And so when they hear that, they're like, well, okay. And I will tell you, some are easier than others, right? So, and I'll tell you, one of our presidents, he said it this way. He was a little bit more difficult of a customer. He said, well, Tom, I don't know about this. He said, you know, nobody's going to tell me, no board's going to tell me or my business, anything about my business. We're the experts in that. How could a board mm-hmm. tell me about that? I said, Jack, that's not the purpose of the board. He said, oh, it's not? No, the purpose of the board is not to be an expert in your business. It's to help you think through things that you didn't think of from a general business perspective. So when the CIO asks a question about where's your security policy, your people aren't always talking about that right off their tongues about information security. Or when the marketing people say, hey, wait a minute, we're not gonna be able to get our our our, uh, our uh, marketing plan in place to help your business achieve their targets. You're not gonna know about all that. So it brings everybody together. And so that particular president said, all right, well, Color me skeptical. That was his count. Color me skeptical, but I'll try it. And then since we've tried it, he's been a believer. So after like a couple of years, he came back to me, said, you know, Tom, he said, I'm surprised. He said, this actually is better than I thought. And I'm, I'm no longer skeptical. I think this is a pretty good idea. So again, this will take effort. It's And it, and it won't necessarily be easy to, again, influence, right? You're not trying to convince people. You're trying to influence yeah. them that this is a better practice and if you can have examples, like the examples we're sharing today, that wait a minute, how could it be that others do something like this and it doesn't work here? How can that be? So again, use your good influence skills to help those business executives see the value of why they would want to do this and put it in language they can understand about helping to meet their business performance targets. This is what this is designed to do. If you can do that, I think in most cases, you will at least get what I got from the one president, which is, well, all right, I'll give it a try. The others were a little bit more enthusiastic. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. I'd like to see how this operates. But then you got to perform, right? Then the board has to demonstrate that it actually really is adding that type of value. Uh, That's an excellent answer, Uh, Tom. So moving on, next slide. Yeah, so at the end of the day, you know, we need to play this ROI game. And uh, and I recall the other day when you said, you know, uh, procurement shouldn't often get into the food fight uh, with the finance team. You know, the, some someday or other, there is always this friction going on uh, between finance and procurement. So how does the board uh, operate I and mean, help in measuring this ROI? I think that's very important uh, for people to know. You know, I mean, it completely takes this off the table. I mean, it's it's wonderful. Can you can you explain that? Yeah, exactly. So it happens every place I've been, and I would submit that anybody that's on this call that's worked in procurement for a while will resonate with this. What happens is if procurement starts quoting the numbers, then people get nervous. They're like, "Well, wait a minute. We don't see the money in our wallet. We don't see where the money went." And so, I, I, I again, one of the things I learned is, look, I'm not quoting the numbers here. That's not my job. My job is to help the business get the numbers. Finance and the business have to be accountable for for what number it is and where the money went. And I'll give you a simple example. And this happened to me, uh, fortunately, 30 years ago, 25 years ago when I was at Shell and happened to my leadership at the time. And they were very smart people. And they taught me this uh, lesson. So my leadership at the time was getting uh, uh, really 
uh, backlash from the business to say, hey, you said you saved all this money. We don't see it. We don't know where it went. And yet we, you know, my leadership at the time was saying, no, no, we gave it all to them. They saw it all. They don't want to be accountable for it. They don't want to admit it because they spent it on something else. Well, okay. What we did at that time was to say, again, whose money is it? It's not procurement's money. It's the business's money. So if the business agrees that the money has been truly went to the P&L, then finance has to validate that. They have to say, yes, I can see that's in the P&L. Or if the president makes the decision to say, no, no, I'm going to take that money. I'm not going to put it to the P&L. I'm not going to put it to net income. I want to repurpose that. I want to reinvest that in my business. That's the president's decision. But then the president has to be accountable for that. They can't come back to me as the chief procurement officer or procurement to say, what'd you do with my money? No, no, it's what you did with your money, not me. I gave you the money. You got to be accountable for that. So I think that's the first lesson that's behind the Wizard of Oz curtain for many procurement organizations. They think they've got to quote all the numbers. No, no, you got to deliver it. With, you got to facilitate that with the business. The business and finance have to be accountable. And the way we make that work with the board is we get with our finance and business colleagues before the board to make sure that they all both agree at that lower level, finance and the business, that this is the P&L improvement that's been delivered by this initiative. So there's no grade, no, no daylight between the business, finance, and my organization about what's getting quoted to the board. So when it gets to the board, and sometimes we even ask our finance guys to chime in to say, yeah, isn't that the right, oh, that is exactly the right number. Yep, we validate all, we see it in the, see it in the books, we see it in the budget, and uh, that, that's all very good. Um, so the other piece to this, though, is, look, that's how we've made this real. And then again, it gets back to measuring the performance of procurement th through the board. What we what we attempt to do with this board, and we're pretty successful at it, is to recognize that performance a balanced scorecard. It's not just about a number. It's first about certainly uh, 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 risk. In other words, if you're not managing supply risk, you can have the greatest P&L improvement in the world, but you're going to be out of business you won't be able to run the business. So part of measuring procurement performance, supply performance is measuring their supply risk that you're helping to mitigate. That's clearly a, an element of the balance scorecard. The other element of the balance scorecard is stakeholder satisfaction, both internal stakeholder and external stakeholder. Because I would submit, if the stakeholder isn't satisfied and they're not successful, procurement can't be successful. Why? Because we're not running the business. They're running the business. So that's another element of scorecard. The other element of scorecard is P&L improvement, right? Which I just shared with you. How do you measure that? We talked about that. The last one is employee satisfaction. The people on my team have to feel satisfied that they're getting the professional development, the growth opportunities, the um, exposure to the senior leadership. And I tell people this all the time on my team, guys, they've all worked in different industries. How many times were you with the senior executives of the company every month? Oh, never, Tom. We never got exposure like that. Well, you're doing that with the board every month. Those, those senior executives see you every month. That's powerful. And then the bullseye out of all this, uh, Saki, as you rightly said, the ROI is the bullseye, which is how much do we cost? How much do we help facilitate deliver? That's the return on investment. So here's a simple example. I'll just use a, a really simple example. If your procurement budget is $10 million a year, where your people, your tools, all the stuff you have to operate procurement, Benchmark would say you should be helping deliver two to three X of that a year, okay, on average. So that'd be 20 to $30 million that you should be helping the business facilitate to get to their P&L that they agree with. That's, 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 that's a very average benchmark. If you were world-class, you'd be at five to 10 X of that. Uh, most organizations aren't there. They're, they're more in the maybe the one X, the two X, but even with that, think how powerful a story that is to tell you business leaders. We pay for ourselves. We pay for ourselves two or three times over. You don't have to worry about, uh, we're the only function that generates cash like that. Finance can't say that. Uh, typically, IT can't say that. Marketing can't say that. HR can't say that. But we pay for ourselves. And when you tell people that story, I can tell you, I don't get too many questions from our presidents about how much am I costing over there. They're more interested in the ROI, which I'm deliv we're delivering with them. And that's a much easier conversation. Yeah, uh, in fact, we are starting to get many questions and comments. Uh, so as you were discussing about this p &L improvement, we received a question uh, from Wendy Rocco. How do you address p and improvement when the stakeholder thinks their budgets will be cut if savings occur through the strategic sourcing process? 
and then you made that answer so so she she said this question was just answered in uh, tom's further discussion so thank you uh, thank you wendy for that uh, uh, comment so we have a question here from uh, Christoph Sobolowski, which I think is very interesting, uh, Tom. Uh, don't you think that operations might state, if I'm responsible for costs, then I want to select the suppliers and do the negotiations by myself? That's a great question. And I would say two, two things to that. Yes, I want them in part of the selection process. They have to be accountable for what suppliers we use. I shouldn't be selecting their suppliers. I should be influencing them of which suppliers I think they may want to consider right? That's our job. But at the end of the day, they have to make the final choice on which supplier is good for their business because they're running their business, right? So I would agree with that point. And look, I don't think they want to do the negotiations themselves. They could, but here would be my, my comeback to that. Guys, look, if you want to do the negotiation yourself, then I think at a minimum, we got to operate within boundaries because I'm supposed to be helping you with the best advice I can give you about how to do a negotiation, which starts with facts, it's not just about shining a bright light on somebody in a room and asking them for a nickel more. That's what a lot of people, business people think. Oh, I'll go do the nickel. I buy things all the time. I'll, I'll do that. Well, when they see a more professional approach, then they get influenced to say, no, no, I, I want to I be at the front end of the negotiation, but I need help. I need coaching about how I should do that. I think that's beautiful. So I would turn that around to that business stakeholder. They say, oh, I want to I want to do the negotiation. OK, if you want to do it, that's great. But let us give you a little bit of thought around how this should work and then do some role play with them. When we do that with our stakeholders, then our stakeholders, they want to be part of it. But then they see what their real role is. Their role should be more of a business leader, not a negotiator. They should be there at the table, basically articulating why this is important to them and leave the details to the experts, which are typically procurement and our good risk and legal colleagues. That's what we're bringing forward, right? So again, it's a, it's a collaborative approach. Yeah, uh, thanks, thanks, Tom. Uh, another another question, uh, very interesting question again, from Frederick Blank. Uh, thank you, Tom. Very interesting. Uh, how do you handle the fact that there are several cooks in the kitchen, and keep a tight tight schedule. Uh, thank you. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And you're right. There are a lot of cooks in the kitchen and there's there, so there's an art to this. It's not a perfect science, right? So look, I will tell you, at least in my experience, the more senior you go up in the organization, senior executives want to be more deferential. That doesn't happen in lower parts of the organization. Lower parts of the organization, everybody wants to weigh in. They want to get their voice in, to your point, a lot of cooks in the kitchen. But what you'll find is when you get to this level, the more senior executive level, we don't have a lot of executives just you know, opining on things. They really choose their words carefully and they're pretty skilled. And if they're not skilled, we help them be skilled by coaching them uh, to uh, you know, the questions they should be asking. And maybe if they ask different, you know, too many questions, we give them a little coaching on that too. So that, that hasn't been a real problem, at least for me at my level. But when I was, when you, uh, for some people on the phone, when I was a category manager and a buyer, that is a problem, right? You got a lot of people, the cooks in the kitchen that want to weigh in on everything. And I think the best you can do there is be, first of all, be a good listener. You don't want to cut people off. You want to be a good listener, but then you got to manage that. Right. You got to practice your own skill set about how do you manage that? We used to call it herding cats. You got a lot of cats that you got to herd. You, that's what a category manager does. Right. They, they run cross functional teams and you got a lot of cooks in the kitchen that have different viewpoints. That takes practice. And uh, the one advice I would give, though, since you've asked the question, for those of you that haven't read the book or seen the video, there's an excellent book on this topic. It's called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni. It's been a bestseller in the Wall Street Journal on their bestseller list for the last 10 years. And it's a very short book, but what, what, what that book talks about is exactly the answer to your question. How do you herd cats? How do you get people with a lot of cooks in the kitchen into a place where they feel comfortable bringing things forward, but they don't monopolize the conversation? That takes practice. So that art of the five, I would call it the five functions of a team. The book's called The Five Dysfunction. It shows you what you shouldn't be doing, and it, and it morphs over to the five function. And then there's a 40-minute video that's on YouTube on that that's actually very good as well. Uh, thanks, Tom. So there are two questions. Uh, both are kind of related to uh, cost. So the first one is from Ann Stewart. 
So Anne asks, when calculating ROI, uh, do you include cost avoidance as well as direct bottom line savings? So this is from Anne Stewart. The other one, next question is from Rodrigo Herdia. How do you calculate the cost of procurement? Just sourcing cost or the entire source to pay organization cost? Yeah, great, great questions. Let's take the uh, last one first. So how you calculate the cost of procurement function is everything that's in my budget as the chief procurement officer, everything that's in my budget. So that's all my staff costs. That's all my tool costs, my benchmarking tools, my market intelligence tools, um, my telecom tools, uh, my risk tools, my supply diversity tools, uh, my sustainability tools. That costs a lot of money. That's all in my budget. So that's what that's how you measure procurement. It's all in one, you know, one budget, if you will. And that I gotta excuse me here. Excuse me. Uh that was uh so that's how you calculate the procurement. It's gotta be what's in the procurement budget. That's the simple version of that. Everything that costs to run procurement. This the other question was around you remind the first question again, Sakti, was around oh, cost avoidance. Yeah, yeah, the ROI, from, yeah, yeah, the ROI in this mode is really just the direct P&L improvement, not cost avoidance. And here's why, because that's what's really real to the business. They can actually see the money. Cost avoidance, they don't always see it. Now, here's how we manage this, because this gets very contentious for a lot of procurement organizations, including my own, that says, oh, wait a minute, Tom, I want to make sure that we get credit because we're really helping the business, even though they didn't see it in the P&L, we avoided a significant cost. Oh, absolutely. We do track that. So we track both. We track cost avoidance and we cost we track a P real P&L improvement that goes directly into the into the budgets of the stakeholders. But what we focus the ROI on is it's a much more conservative measure is just the P&L improvement, okay? Now you could do it both ways, but I would submit to you, I would probably start, if you're starting on this, I'd be more conservative, show a lower number, and that would get the credibility with the business. And then over time, you could probably educate the business to say, hey, maybe we should be counting some of that cost avoidance in our ROI because you wouldn't have got that if we hadn't existed and that's part of our budget. So there's, a, there's an argument to be made for both sides. I would just say, be careful on how you do that and I'm always a big believer, start small, you know, be conservative first, get people's appetite wet, get them in, engaged, and then you can always broaden it. Okay, that's great. Uh, so there are a couple of questions from Megan Tibbs. Uh, so I'll read both the questions, uh, Tom. Uh, what about considering risk in deciding what is presented to the board? Sometimes a low spend engagement can still incur a lot of risk. Uh, are, are exceptions made for these types of initiatives when considering the spend threshold? And then she follows up, how was the $250,000 threshold uh, was determined or chosen? Yeah, excellent. So the first question first, yes. So there is flexibility here, right? So you're quite right. Look, the 250 uh, our material element, uh, we have a lot of risk that goes below 250 right? Some of our smallest suppliers could be our riskiest suppliers. So that's true. And so we're mindful of that. So our supplier risk monitoring tools that we've invested in that's in my budget, they're monitoring the whole supply base, not just the 250 or greater. The board is typically just seeing those that are above the 250 watermark. But to your point, Megan, if it's a significant risk that we see, even with a lower level supplier below 250, we will bring that to the board. And, and the other point I will say is we also have a supplier risk council that operates in conjunction with the board. It meets at the first Friday of every month that does exactly that. It looks at all of our supply base from a risk perspective. So the board is really about the procurement strategy, which includes the risk strategy, but the risk council is focused more on some of the lower level stuff as well. But again, your question is a good, it, can, it is designed to be flexible. And then your second question about how did we come up with the 250? What I said before, this, this, you have to look at this individually by company to say what works for you, because what you can't have is you can't inundate an executive board with a, with, you know, a huge amount of submittals. It won't work. It's just too much. So what we did was we looked at our spend. We 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 spend a billion three a year with third party suppliers, and we said how many transactions are greater than 250. We saw that there's about 70 or 80 in our spend profile that are greater than 250 on an average year. We looked back three years and we said, okay, well, 70 or 80, we can deal with that because the board meets every month, do the math, 12 into 70, eh, it's about six smittles. 
that's about right. You can't really do more than about six submittals at a board meeting. It's just too much because each board submittal usually takes about, you know, five to 10 minutes or so. So do the math, six, 10, there's 60 minutes right there. And by the way, we do not let this board run long. That you, that's an executive no-no. We, we run this like a board of directors, man. We are like a German train station. We start on time, we end on time. And I will tell you, my secretary of the board, who is a direct report to me, manages that really closely. And by the way, the secretary of the board, for those of you in Europe, you'll know what I'm speaking about. You typically had the secretary is not the uh, admin. It's the actual the senior business leader who's managing the agenda for the board to make sure those agendas and those submittals are fit for purpose. Just like you would have a board secretary at a board of directors, a corporate board of directors. So for those of you in the Global Fortune 500, you have a board of directors. You have a corporate board secretary that is a senior executive in your company, usually in investor relations or in the finance organization that runs the board agenda on behalf of the CEO. I have the same thing. That senior leader of mine, that person runs our board like a board of directors. Okay, that's that's excellent. Uh, Tom, so we have a question from uh, Ariane Beroud. Uh, many thanks, Tom, very inspiring. To report p &L improvement, you need a clear baseline. However, initial budgets are not always very transparent. Uh, did you experiment this and how do you manage ensuring you have the right baseline or budget to report procurement performance uh, in relation to the budget? Uh, thank you. Yeah, another great question. Boy, you guys are really practitioners here. You remind me of how I grew up. So this is an executive practitioner call. You are quite right. That happens in every organization. No organization is immune to that problem you just submitted. And here's how I've dealt with it in all the places I've been. Look, at the end of the day, we've got to challenge the business, respectfully challenge and our finance people, what is the baseline here? Where is the baseline? And the finance people in some cases will know it, but they won't they won't volunteer it. So you got to pull it out of them. You got to challenge them, right? That's the skill. You got to practice that a little bit. And in some cases, to the to the gentleman's question, they don't know. Oh my God, we don't know what the baseline is. We don't know what the volume is before. We didn't know. Okay, but you're gonna have to take a stab at that. Right? It won't be perfect, but we have to have something to be able to measure the improvement. To your point, this isn't always a perfect science, but, but at the end of the day, as long as finance says it, they're the keeper of the books, not me. I'm not saying that, and the business won't say it, but finance will say, okay, look, we got to have a baseline. This is the best I can come up with, and the business will say, okay, well, that, yeah, okay, I'll agree to that. That's close enough, or, or the business say, I can't agree to that. Well, then you got to come to an agreement on that baseline. So again, that's the collaboration and the cha respectful challenge of both your business business leaders and your finance people about what that baseline is. It's, it, won't, it won't always be clear. You're quite correct. Okay, I, we, we have one slide left, in fact. Uh, <laughs> you know, the questions are coming thick and fast. Uh, uh, next slide, please. I think we have stayed on the slide for, for far too long. Yeah, uh, so quickly, uh, Tom, does one size fits all? Uh, yeah, no, it, it doesn't. And look, that's what I said at the front end. Uh, you have to make this fit for purpose for your organization, your culture, and frankly, your capabilities. Not, not every procurement organization is built for this. It's not how you were typically taught or your leadership was taught. So you have to you have to fit this for what you're dealing with, your own capabilities, your culture of your company, as well as uh, you know what you're trying to accomplish. I would say this, the principles we're talking about, they will work anywhere. But how you package it and how you do it, that's gonna be up to you. And I'll give you a simple example. When we did this at Shell, we called it the Global Procurement Board. That worked for us because we were about procurement. When I went into um, the other Fortune 500, we called it the uh, Customer Stakeholder Advisory Board because that company was really about internal customers and external customers. And we were a customer facing business. so. We they they like the term customer to talk about internal stuff. So we call it the customer advisory board. And then when we when I went into healthcare, I worked in two of the largest healthcare systems in the United States. They also like the word customer or patient. So we called it customer advisory board. And by the way, when we did this in healthcare for the physicians to attend, because again, though the clinicians, those are the people that are the business leaders. They, they, have, they have office hours, they practice with patients. So we did this before their normal office hour. We started it at 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. 
so that they could go meet their patients at eight o'clock. And they love that. So you have to be flexible in how you set this up. Don't don't be too rigid. And then um, uh, lastly is that, uh, look, the uh, there, there's a there's a there's an art here. Right. It's not all science. You got to you got to make this fit for purpose for what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah, indeed. So uh, I know we have five minutes uh, on the clock. Uh, Tom. Can you move to the next slide? Uh, we are done with the presentation, but we have a few more questions here. Maybe go to the last one. Uh, last slide, please. Yeah, so that there's an email ID there. So if they have any questions, they can email us also. Uh, so this question is from Manish Avasti. Uh, Tom, can a board decide on procurement policy? Uh, what are the key factors a procurement department should be handy for? before meeting the board? Uh, thank you, Tom. Yeah, that's a great question. Yes, the board can have an impact on procurement policy. These are senior business executives, they're running the company. So you'll see, you would see that in our, in our guidelines for the board of what's appropriate to bring to the board. What's appropriate to bring to the board is not just procurement strategies for initiatives, but also things that impact my organization, like policies, procedures. Um, if I'm doing a major reorganization of my organization, I would bring that to the board to say, guys, I'm keeping you informed. Because again, the purpose of the board is to keep them informed of things that impact their business. And guess what? The things that I do as the chief procurement officer, it impacts their business. So I don't want them It'd be like a board of directors. Why a CEO manages, you know, very closely the agenda for a board of directors? That's most CEOs do not want to surprise their board. I don't want to surprise my board, right? I want to make sure they're informed. And so there's numerous things that you would think about bringing to the board for their endorsement. And, and lastly, here's how the board, you know, really is, is designed to operate. The board members have three choices when a submittal or a, a proposal comes to them that I want their opinion on. They can either say, I endorse it. I don't use the word approval. The proof, this is not command and control. This is endorse. I can endorse it. I don't endorse it because I don't, I don't agree with it. Or I need more information. I need you to go back and work this a little further and come back to the board with a little bit more for me. Those are the only three choices. So that's why this becomes a very practical but relevant body, governance body. It's a governance body to get decisions made. Because all of you know, as executives and practitioners on this call, this is the bane of procurement. You guys get strung out all the time. Ah, people can't make decisions. They're all takes too long and you know, blah, blah, blah. And then they blame us for the process taking so long. No, no. So what comes to the board, the board's gonna make a decision. They're gonna endorse or not endorse or ask for more information. So that I think is a key element. Okay, uh, so we have about three minutes on the clock. We have a few more questions here, Tom. So this one is from Magnus Elman. How do you define what a saving is versus cost avoidance? Yeah, very simply. Uh, so again, and you can go to any benchmark on this. So the Institute for Supply Management, our professional association, spells this out very nicely, the definition between a true P&L improvement versus cost avoidance. You can also go to Hackett. You can go to uh, a number of other nice benchmark sources to get the facts. But here's what the what I believe you're going to find. And this is uh, I, 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 factual. A P&L improvement means the business actually sees it in their budget. It's real money. A cost avoidance is they would have never seen it in their budget. So here's the example of a cost avoidance. A supplier comes to you with a, with a price increase. You work with that supplier to negate that price increase. You never paid the price increase, so it never showed up in the budget, but you negated it through good procurement work, fact-based negotiation, whatever you did, that's a cost avoidance. So you have to be clear on the definition of these. And what we do is we give real life examples like that so nobody gets confused about what's the difference between or, uh, what is a P&L improvement versus a cost avoidance. Get the definition on paper, you know, go to those benchmarks to have the facts and then use real life examples so people know what you're talking about. Okay, uh, would you like to take one question, Tom, maybe? maybe three more minutes extra would sure. that be okay no, happy yeah. to no, happy to okay okay uh, this is from ishani surju does business not view this board as asking the business to do the procurement's job yeah that's a very nice question very insightful no that's a very good question uh 
you know, nobody's ever said that, but you could, you, one could see that. One, I think that's a very insightful question. One could say, well, isn't this what procurement is supposed to be doing? They should be accountable for their own strategies. My answer to that would be yes, but again, this gets back to whose money is it and whose business is it? It's not my money. It's not my their business. I can't be accountable for decisions they make. So if they want to make the decision, they have to be informed. The board keeps them informed of the strategy. So that's the difference here. So yes, an uneducated person could say, oh my God, I don't wanna do procurement's work for them. This is what procurement should be doing. My corollary to that would be, no, 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 no. This is not just procurement's work. This is the business imperative of making sure the business agrees with what procurement is doing and what procurement is proposing and what the business should be doing. Their job, again, is decide and own, is to challenge, respectfully challenge to say, hey, you're telling me a strategy. What facts do you have to support your strategy? What evidence do you have that this is going to be good for my business? That's their that's their role, not my role. So that's a little different of uh, if, if we were just operating a procurement council, the, the, the lady's comment would be perfect. Yeah, procurement council, a bunch of procurement people. I don't need business people on there. Procurement's doing all that. This is not that. Okay, uh, so we have a question uh, from Sam Abraham. Uh, thanks, Tom. Very insightful and crisp. Is there any way procurement or the board can influence revenue? Uh, oh, absolutely. Since they, since they build relations and not just savings. And does yes. it contribute to ROI? I think it's again to do yes. with ROI. Thank you. Yes, a absolutely. That is a wonderful question. Yes. So when we talk P&L improvement, we're not just talking about, uh, you know, P&L cost improvement. We're talking about P&L revenue enhancement. So P&L is profit and loss. You can influence profit and loss from both revenue and expense. And yes, there are many examples that come forward to our board that are talking about how we are helping the business increase its revenue and margin on the products we sell. And that's a great question because when you get to that level, now you're moving up the pyramid of excellence. And most business people don't see it that way. They think, oh, I thought procurement was just working on cost improvement, P&L cost improvement. No, we do that, but we also help with revenue enhancement and margin enhancement by having smarter, helping the business develop smarter product strategies. So here's a simple example, and this would be a nice takeaway for the group here. You cannot have a supply strategy by itself. The product strategy must align with the supply strategy. A lot of companies don't connect those very easily. I'll tell you who does it the best. If you look at a Ford Motor Company or General Motors or a, an auto man, they do it great. Before they even build a car, they get procurement engaged to say, wait a minute, we can't build a car because 80% of the cost is going in with supply costs. We got to get you engaged up front to make sure your supply strategy will support our product strategy, both in cost and revenue. Because they, they're putting a price on the selling of that car. They can't put a target price on the car without knowing what the target cost is from procurement. That's correct, Tom. So uh, I know we have run out of time. Finally, one question from me. So this, uh, you know, the stakeholder advisory board, it sounds uh, very simple, intuitive. Uh, but why do, you, why do you see many companies have not implemented it yet? And yeah, what, I think, what's the impediment here? Oh. Yeah, I think the impediment is again, it's uh, it's um, two things. One, people typically don't think like this. This is not typical procurement thinking. This is senior executive thinking, right? And business executive thinking. Look, I'm a business executive first. I'm a procurement expert second. And I would hope that everybody on this call would think the same way. You're not okay. procurement. You're not just procurement experts. You should be business people first procurement people second. So point number one, that's why this is not easy for people to get their heads around. This is a business perspective, number one. And then number two, what I said earlier, a lot of procurement organizations aren't built for this. They, they, don't, they don't have the skill set to be able to do this because it goes to the question that came up earlier. This is an influence model. This is not a command and control. This is not telling people about the procurement policy or telling them they have to go do three bids and they got to go do this. Yeah, we, we, we got to do some of that but we got to help the business creatively do that in a way that helps them operate within boundaries. A lot of procurement organizations have to practice that. And, and, and I will say, to be fair to everybody, it's not just procurement. HR has the same problem. Finance has the same problem. IT, they all want to do typically command and control. It's easiest. The, 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 the quickest point between two points is just tell people. Just go tell them. 
Well, no, I don't. You can do that. But if you do that, you're going to win the battle and lose the war. I'm trying to do both. I'm trying to win the battle and win the war. And to win the war, I got to be General Eisenhower, which is I got to influence people. Exactly. Excellent. I think uh, I think we can close close this out with this comment from Nanette Dunn. A great webinar. Thank you, Tom Nash. Great. Well, thank you for having me, guys. And again, I'm happy to be of help in any way that I can. So I'm on LinkedIn. If anybody wants to reach out to me, be happy to accept. Thank you all. Yes. Look forward to uh, next conversation. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, okay. That was a very great session on how to effectively manage stakeholders. I think it's one of a kind what you have uh, done at uh, uh, Red Cross. I mean, kudos to you. Uh, we have received several more interesting questions, but unfortunately, uh, we have run out of time. Uh, this marks the end of our session. A big thank you uh, to all the participants for logging in today. Uh, yes, yeah, so some of you have asked, would you be sharing the recording? Yes, uh, we will be sharing the uh, recording link with all of you soon. Uh, please do reach out to the email address uh, that's on the screen. If you have any additional questions, uh, I will ship it to Tom uh, for him to answer them for you. Okay. Thank you and have a good day. And to all those in Asia, good night.